All right, let's go to our sermon time. I want you to open your Bibles to one verse briefly, uh, Psalm 68, Psalm 68. And I'm going to call your attention to verse 20. Psalm 68, verse 20. It says in this verse, He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. The issues of life are said to come from the heart of man. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. But the issues of death belong to God. Death will eventually come to every man, and uh, it says there is no discharge in that war, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 8. And uh, it is appointed unto every man once to die, but after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27 states. And you don't know when, and you don't know where, and you don't know exactly how, but you know that someday you're going to die. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. But we know that we can't avoid it. Death is on the way. And I'm not just bringing this sermon to you because I work in a funeral home during the week. It's not like my hobby, right? I really enjoy talking about it. But it's a necessary part. It's part of the Word of God. It's part of life. And um, the Bible said, it says it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8. It's a, a sobering and a very instructive thing to look into the casket of someone who's passed away, who's gone, rather than looking into a baby's cradle or a playpen. Those things may or may not happen. Not everyone has children. They want to, but God never blessed them with the ability to have them. Uh, you might not get that job promotion, so there's no reason to celebrate. You might not reach that marriage milestone, 40 years, 50 years, and have a big party. You might not, those things may or may not happen, but death is going to come to everybody. That much you can't deny. And um, I preached this sermon. I was checking, it has been five years since I brought this sermon. I enjoyed preaching it when I did. I don't know if you enjoyed hearing it, but I have bad news. You're going to hear it again just now. Uh, we coined little euphemisms uh, and, and phrases to describe death to make it go down a little easier, make it seem a little bit more uh, palatable. And some are very, very humorous. Let me read to you uh, several of them. We say that uh, he's now at room temperature, or someone assumed room temperature. Uh, he's taking a dirt nap. He's pushing up the daisies. He's inspecting the radishes from the roots up. He's passed over. He's passed on. He's passed away. He's deceased. He's demised. He has ceased to be. He is no more. He has expired. He's gone to meet his maker, or she's gone to meet her maker. He is bereft of life. He's resting in peace. He's kicked the bucket. He's shuffled off this mortal coil. He's joined the choir invisible. He's gone into that good night. He's crossed over. He's crossed the bar. He's bought the farm. He's asleep. He's now belly up or toes up. Um, he's cadaverous. He's checked out. He's defunct. He's extinct. He's inanimate. He's late, the late so-and-so. He's lifeless. He's perished. He's in repose. He's lost, like we lost the patient. And uh, he's cashed in, or he's cashed out. He's cashed in his chips. He's uh, gone into the West. He's kicked off. He got a one-way ticket. He's croaked. She's danced the last dance. Uh, they sprouted wings. They succumbed. They're no longer with us. Uh, he's returned to the ground. He's gone with the ancestors. He's been gathered to his people. He's given up the ghost. He's in the grave. 
he's terminated. He's put down, or been put down. He's gone to the big whatever it is in the sky. Tommy Lasorda used to talk a big, about the big dodger in the sky who was blessing them with championship wins. Uh, he's bought a pine condo because caskets used to be made out of pine wood. He's gone into the fertilizer business. He's become living challenged. That's a politically correct uh, way of saying it. Uh, younger people today, you would say he's posted his last blog. He sent his last text. She sent her last tweet. His account has been uh, uh, canceled. Uh, they've logged off. And uh, the black brethren say very commonly that they've heard someone's gone from sunrise to sunset. And uh, I've coined a few of my own. He's gone from breathing to yearning to breathe free. He's gone from vertical to horizontal. He's, his switch has been turned off. And uh, Brother Lee likes this one, as a, a wise guy in Brooklyn might say, bada boom, bada bing, eh? <laughs> and so if you'll indulge me, I'm going to bring to you another ser a sermon again I call The Issues of Death. What happens when someone dies? A little background is necessary before we get to the first point. Paul writes, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God made man in three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Man is, just, is not just a body and a spirit. He has three parts to him. If you understand that you have a body, and that you have a spirit, then it makes some sense that there's a third part of you that recognizes those two distinctions. That's the soul. That's the real you. If sometimes you want to do what is quick and easy and satisfies your flesh and your wants, uh, that's the, the urges of the body. But then at other times, you know that you should pursue something more noble, something more uh, lofty, something respectable and dignified then it stands to reason there's a third part of you that's being pulled in either of these two directions. It's illustrated in cartoons and comic shows where you have a little angel on one shoulder and a little devil on the other shoulder and they're whispering in your ear telling you to do this or to do that. And the part of you in the middle that uh, is being pulled in either direction is the soul. That's the real you. This is how God made man in the beginning. Genesis 2 verse 7 says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. The dust of the ground, that's where the body comes from. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the spirit. It makes the body move and animates the body. And man became a living soul. So point number one, first of all, God made man in three parts. God made man in three parts. I'll just give you very simple um, expressions for each point. Genesis 3, verse 19 says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Ecclesiastes 3, in verse 20, tells us, All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. So that's what you were formed of, uh, formed out of, and that is what you're going to return to one day. The same minerals, the same elements uh, found in the dirt can also be found in the human body. The word humus, H-U-M-U-S, from which we get the word human, means decayed, rotting vegetation, like the soggy leaves on the bottom of your flower bed. That's humus. That's you. Something that's uh, awarded to someone uh, posthumously or posthumously means it's awarded to someone after they've already died, after they're already in the ground decaying. So point number two is this. The body goes back to the elements upon death. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 21 asks, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward? and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7 says, 
Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. Christ said on the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, verse 46. And then later on, Stephen was right to say, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Acts 7, verse 60. The spirit is the life of the body. It makes the body move. It keeps the heart beating in the chest. It animates the body. It, it, it causes the body to be able to function and perform the task that it performs. A saved man wants to serve God in this body. An unsaved man does not want to. His spirit is said to be a dead spirit as far as God's concerned. That's a doctrinal um, distinction that needs to be kept in mind. Uh, did you ever think that the same breath that God first breathed into Adam and make his body come alive is still being passed from parent to child to child to child every generation through DNA and genetics and the transmission of life. The same life that first came into the lungs and the body of Adam is the same life that's been transmitted to everyone since that time. So point number three today, let me say this. The spirit returns to God. The body decays and goes back to the ground, but the spirit goes back to God. And only the Bible is able to really differentiate between these three parts. Uh, Hebrews 4, verse 12 says, uh, oh, what does it say? Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, that's the body, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What is? The word of God is. The Bible is able to read your mind. It knows what you're thinking. It knows what you're going to do. It knows what you're going to say. Because, as Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. The same human re uh, reactions to the circumstances of life haven't changed much in thousands of years. Just the, the tools and the, the mechanisms, the things by which we express our anger. They didn't have guns and rifles and explosives in Old Testament times, but they sure got them now. And the same impulses, the same reactions and, and responses to troubles in life uh, are simply carried out, acted out with different means. Otherwise, human nature hasn't changed at all. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, but the spirit is not the soul, and the soul is not the body. Uh, so what about this third part of man? What about the soul? Genesis 35, we read about Rachel having hard labor. And in verse 18, it tells us, It came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. As death was taking hold on her, and she's in labor, her soul was leaving the body. Uh, Paul uses this same language in Philippians 1, verses 23 and 24. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Elijah goes to the house of a widow whose only son was dead. And we read in 1 Kings 17, verses 21 and 22. He stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. So point number four, at death, the soul leaves the body. As an old American epitaph on a gravestone which said, Remember, my friend, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you too shall be. Prepare for death and follow me. Well, that's not very cheery or encouraging, is it? I think if you go to Knott's Berry Farm, they have a, like a, looks like an old boot hill cowboy type cemetery. And I think they've actually got those words 
uh, reprinted on one of the little wooden or tombstones in their make uh, make believe uh, graveyard. But the uh, the soul doesn't just go to sleep in the cemetery. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. That's what the uh, sort of Jehovah's Witness light Christadelphians, and that's what the Seventh Day Adventist Church has historically taught. That when you die, the soul simply goes unconscious and just lays there, doesn't go anywhere. The Word of God has a lot to reveal about the soul of man, however. We read in 1 Samuel 28, that King Saul couldn't get any light from God on how to defeat the Philistines. And uh, Prophet Samuel had recently died, so he consulted a woman, they said, a, a woman who had a familiar spirit. Now in those days, someone who, was a, who had a familiar spirit, today we would call her a witch, but uh, she would contact some entity, some spirit, and uh, the, the spirit would impersonate the one that the customer wanted to contact. And she was familiar with this spirit, necromancy, people who uh, involve themselves with contacting the dead and trusting that the dead will speak to them and so forth. It's just witchcraft and darkness all the way around, so uh, avoid it wherever you find it. But that's nevertheless the case in, these, in those times. And so King Saul goes to this uh, woman, and um, in 1 Samuel 28, verse 11, uh, he's hoping that she can contact um, uh, uh, Samuel and get some light, some instruction on how to defeat the Philistines. And 1 Samuel 28, 11, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up to thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. Verse 12, And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. See, she wasn't expecting to hit the real McCoy. She wasn't expecting to reach the real one. And the real one appeared to her. Verse 14, Saul, and he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is clothed with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. Point number five. The soul bears the image of the body that it once inhabited. The soul bears the image of the body, like taking your hand out of a glove. The glove is not the real you. You leave it behind. And so it is with the soul coming out of the body. In Luke chapter 16, we read the account of Lazarus and the rich man. After they both died, the rich man found his soul in torment, but he saw Lazarus being comforted. The rich man saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus up against his bosom receiving comfort. And the rich man cried for Abraham to send Lazarus uh, to get, send even, bring even a drop of water to cool his tongue. And the rich man pleaded with Abraham to send Lazarus uh, back to the land of the living to preach to his brothers. He had five brothers. He said he didn't want them to end up in the same place. So the number of things we can learn about the soul of man. Number one, departed souls are not simply unconscious. They can recognize one another. They bear the image of their former bodies. They can communicate with one another. They can sense both pain and pleasure, whichever the case may be. And they are aware of the conditions taking place here on the earth. And I would dare say that the departed soul in hell is more concerned with you not going to hell than most Christians are today. Most Christians, uh, I think it was General Booth of the Salvation Army said, give me 50 men uh, and let them spend 30 minutes in hell and come back. I'll change the world with those men. Once you have a real eye-opening uh, view and a glimpse of what eternity will be without Jesus Christ, you don't want anyone to go there. And the best you and I can do is pray that God would make these things real to us here in the land of the living. The Bible says in Revelation 6, verses 9, 10, and 11, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, 
Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Because the soul bears a, a bodily shape, it's able to wear a white robe given to it by Jesus Christ. Point number six is this. At death, the soul goes to one of two places, either to heaven or to hell, either to a place of comfort as Lazarus enjoyed or to a place of fiery torment as the rich man experienced. It doesn't just hang around uh, haunting old buildings and making the hairbrush fly across the bedroom just to, you know, look great on a, some reality TV show. Nor does the Bible teach reincarnation. Uh, Hebrews 9.27, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, as it is appointed unto uh, every man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. Job 7, verses 9 and 10 declare, As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. The Bible it does not teach reincarnation. When Jesus said you must be born again, he wasn't talking about reincarnation, right? Die and come back again. That's not what he meant. Although there are some morons who have twisted the scriptures to interpret it that way. But those who were righteous before God in the Old Testament went to a place of comfort. Those who were not righteous, they ended up in the fiery torment where the rich man found himself. And uh, a man's righteousness before Jesus Christ showed up was based on his degree of obedience to the law of Moses and the commandments, the, the Ten Commandments uh, as an example, and all the rest. And um, Moses told the people, Deuteronomy 6.25, uh, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. And you read in the Old Testament, the people gave answer back to Moses, all that the Lord hath commanded us will we do and be obedient. But they weren't. They rebelled. They rebelled against Moses' authority. They rebelled against the commandments of God. They complained. But in the New Testament, we read, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus 3, 5. It's the Holy Ghost who washes and regenerates and renews the sinner and makes him go from sinner to saint that fast. That, that is the most miraculous transformation that can take place to go from a sinner uh, deserving of hell covered with the wickedness and the filth of your own sin, suddenly to a saint, Amen. with your name written in the Lamb's book of life, and heaven promised to you. But the Holy Spirit washes you clean. He regenerates your dead spirit uh, alone, by Christ alone, not by anything you can do or any works that you can perform. By faith, Christ's righteousness, the merit, the value the virtue of all of his goodness is imputed to you. It's credited to your account, according to Romans chapter 4. Blessed is the man unto whom God will not impute right, uh, uh, sin. God imputes his righteousness to you. Your, his righteousness and the perfection of Jesus Christ now covers you when God looks at you. He doesn't see a sin on you. Be because you're still in this body, the body still wants to commit sin. But that has no effect on the soul. That has no effect on your new birth. That has no effect on your being a son of God by faith. And now a man's eternal reward is determined by whether or not he truly knows Jesus Christ. It's a very simple matter. It's a very simple proposition. The Apostle John writes, This is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. So those souls being comforted before the coming of Christ were eventually taken up by Jesus Christ to the third heaven, according to Ephesians 4, verses 8, 9, and 10, which we won't uh, read today. They're described as a great cloud 
of witnesses, Hebrews 12, verse 1. And they're watching what you and I are doing in this life. And you might add to their, their number any Christian who has ever died over the course of the last 2,000 years up until now. That number, thankfully, uh, uh, is growing. It continues to grow. Uh, it never decreases. It never gets smaller. Those born again in Jesus Christ are still born, have been born again in Jesus, are still born and saved by Jesus Christ. No one ever lost their salvation who trusted Jesus Christ. So the number only grows. It doesn't diminish. And uh, remember, my friend, as you've passed by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you shall be. Prepare for death and follow me. And later, someone added to that epitaph, To follow you, I am not content, for I do not know which way you went. <laughs> Whoever thought the soul of man was simply the spirit without any shape? floating around, going to sleep, doing nothing. He wasn't reading his Bible very closely. He certainly wasn't comparing Scripture with Scripture. You know, the word soul is a different word than the word spirit. Why all these modern Bibles and modern Christians seem to think it's all just spirit, body and spirit, body and spirit, body and spirit. And, and they are ignorant of the obvious fact that there's got to be a third part of them that recognizes these two. That's the soul. That's the real you. But Hebrews 9, 27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, uh, and after this, the judgment. You can cancel a dentist appointment. You can cancel a business appointment. But there's an appointment you have with death, and you can't cancel it. You can't say, um, I'm going to come in next week if that's okay. It's going <laughs> to... You can't change it. Are you ready to meet God? If you died tonight, do you know that you'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ? I'm so glad that God saved me when I was just a small boy. And um, the Bible, or well, it's the, not the Bible, there's an old expression that says, life is short, death is sure. Sin, the curse, but Christ, the cure. I'm glad that I know him. I'm glad that I've trusted him to be my savior. And if you're saved too, say amen. Well, thank God for that. That's the most important decision you will have ever made in all of eternity. To trust Jesus Christ. You can make important decisions in life. Who to marry. Which job to take. Uh, what kind of car to buy. What kind of home to buy. And uh, what you're going to have for dinner. All kind, kinds of decisions. But the most important decision you'll ever make is whether or not you're going to trust Jesus Christ alone as your Savior. As the forgiver of your sins. As the one who can wash you clean and write your name in heaven.